And uh, then, Gary, you'll, if you come up and share the word with us. Thank you. Thanks for sharing that with us, Simon. It's nice to see everybody here this morning. Our reading is taken from Lamentations, chapter 3. I am the man who has seen affliction by the rod of the Lord's wrath. He has driven me away and made me walk in darkness rather than light. Indeed, he has turned his hand against me again and again all day long. He has made my skin and my flesh grow old, and he has broken my bones. He has besieged me and surrounded me with bitterness and hardship. He has made me dwell in darkness like those long dead. He has walled me in so I cannot escape. He has weighed me down with chains. Even when I call out or cry for help, he shuts out my prayer. He has barred my way with blocks of stone. He has made my paths crooked. Like a bear lying in wait, like a lion in hiding. He dragged me from the path and mangled me and left me without help. He drew his bow and made me the target for his arrows. He pierced my heart with arrows from his quiver. I became the laughingstock of all my people. They mocked me in song all day long. He has filled me with bitter herbs and given me gall to drink. He has broken my teeth with gravel. He has trampled me in the dust. I have been deprived of peace. I have forgotten what prosperity is. So I say, my splendor is gone and all that I had hoped from the Lord. I remember my affliction and my wandering, sorry, wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I will remember them and my soul is downcast within me. Yet this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore I will wait for him. The Lord is good to whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Amen. Amen. That's on. Can everybody? Is that okay? Well, it's nice to see you again. Um, it's a while since my last visit, uh, but it's good to be called off the substitute bench. And um, it's always good to, uh, to be with you. Um, there's a scene at the end of one of my favorite movies, uh, the movie Castaway, where the, the main character is Chuck. Noland, played by Tom Hanks, very fine actor. And the end scene is he's sitting in front of a coal fire with a glass of whiskey and, and ice, and he's talking to a friend, and he, he's, he's, he was rescued, he escaped the island, and he was there for four years. And he's talking about his life on the island, how it was times of darkness with no hope, and he said that even the thing that he, he thought he could have done, he failed at that. He tried to kill himself. And even that, he had no control over. And he's sitting at the end of this the, the, the final scene with his glass of whiskey and the coal fire. And he talks about coming to the place where, on the island, there was no hope. There was no chance of rescue. And he said that, all I could do was breathe. Every attempt to escape failed. And he said, looking back, I've 
got to keep breathing. Got to keep breathing. Because tomorrow the sun will rise and who knows what the tide will bring. And it did actually bring his rescue. But you know, we, we all go through dark times. And, you know, some of us, I, I never realized what a panic attack was until I had one. And it gave a new reality to it when somebody s said that they were suffering from panic attacks and, and dark times to go through it. And I can remember a time when all I could do was breathe. Relationships crashed, loss happened. I was wandering in the darkness, 16 years away from following Jesus, walked away from him, chased after shiny things, and went through dark times. And, but praise God, <laughs> he brings us through. And the, the, the scripture that we read this morning is quite a dark scripture. It's from the book of Lamentations, which means crying. And when Jeremiah was moved by God to write Lamentations, this was a very, very dark time. These were hopeless days. Due to their sin and their constant rebellion... God brought judgment on the children of Israel. The land of Judah went into captivity and was invaded by the Babylonians. In 586, people were dragged away into exile, away from their land. And Jeremiah was left. He didn't go into exile. He sat with the people that were left. The temple was destroyed all worship of God was, all means of worship was taken away, and he sat there. And God moved him to write Lamentations. And it was all based on what was going on around him, what he was suffering himself, what he saw. There was wholesale devastation, there was slaughter. Everyone, it affected every single person kings, princes, elders, priests, prophets. People just like you and me were all affected. Starving mothers were reduced to cannibalism. The society's rich and beautiful people were dragged off into exile. The temple was destroyed. They knew loss. See, under King David and Solomon, there was a golden age that was all gone, and they were left in ruins. So he remained in the land, and he was moved by the Holy Spirit to write the book of Lamentations. Now, the Lord didn't inspire him to write a list of told you so's. That would have been really helpful, wouldn't it? He wasn't inspired to write a booklet called Five Steps to Get Out of the Mess That You're In, or Rules and Teachings to These Rebellious People. But he wrote poems. Lamentations is a book of poems that express the pain and the darkness that he was going through and that they were going through. Five poems. They were acrostic poems. I think that means each letter first line of the, the poem begins with a letter from the, the Hebrew alphabet. So um, chapter 1 and 2, we've got 22 verses. There's 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Chapter 3, which we didn't read all of it, has got 66. So for each letter in the alphabet, there are three lines of poetry. Chapter 4 picks up again 22, 22 verses, A, B, C, D, E the A to Z of passing through these dark times. And then the final chapter just completely loses it. There's no, there's no pattern to it at all. And I just wondered about this, and I thought, well, why, why 
during this dark time, why, why suddenly have we got an acrostic structure of, of the structure there? And I just felt as though it was like the Lord is saying, listen, sometimes we can be over flooded with, with troubles, dark times and problems. And we think everything is out of control. Yet it's not because there's a pattern that God is bringing us through. It's almost as if it's like the banks of a river that, that surround us. The water might be strong. It might be taking over. But there's a pattern. And there's a direction. The reality is that despite what some TV evangelists might tell you, as God's people, we're not immune to going through dark times. About 35 years ago, when I was a, a young believer, I had a great privilege of meeting a Chinese pastor his name was Pastor Zhang. That wasn't his real name. He was a real pastor, but he, his name wasn't Zhang because he, he, he was actually he managed to flee China. And he was imprisoned. He was a pastor of a house church, an illegal church, and he was imprisoned for many years by the authorities. And whilst in prison, he was kept under constant surveillance. Every single moment, he was monitored. And he was put through physical torture, emotional torture. He went through the, the re-education that the communists do. And humanly speaking, all hope was gone. All hope was gone. It was lost. He was stuck in this prison. So for the people of Judah and the, the prophet Jeremiah, in the same way, as I've said, all hope seems to have gone. Now, I just want to pick a few verses out just to paint this picture of darkness. Verse 4 says, He has made my skin and my flesh grow old, and he's broken my bones. Now, in the Bible, broken bones is symbolic of a loss of hope. And, and Jeremiah was expressing this lost hope. He's besieged me and he's surrounded me with bitterness and hardship. Verse 7, he's walled me in so that I cannot escape. And he's weighed me down with chains. Even when I call out, out or cry for help, he shuts out my prayer. And I'm sure all of us have experienced times when we've prayed and we feel as though God is just, he's just nowhere to be, to be heard. And Jeremiah says in verse 10, like a bear lying in wait, like a lion hiding, he dragged me from the path and mangled me and left me without help. He drew his bow and made me the target for his arrows. He pierced my heart with arrows from his quiver. These were dark, painful times. His pain was so great, the, the NRSV version expresses the, the Hebrew like this. He has made my teeth grind on gravel. He has made me cower in ashes. My soul is bereft of peace. I have forgotten what happiness is. The NIV says prosperity. It's another word. I've forgotten what happiness is. And I just wonder whether this morning there's somebody here. You're going through a dark time to the point where you, you, happiness is a distant memory. You've forgotten what happiness is. Verse 18, so I say my splendor is gone and all that I had hoped from the Lord. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them. and My soul is downcast within me. My splendor is gone and all that I had hoped from the Lord. I know what that feels like. I can remember as a young believer thinking that I was God's man of faith and power and I realized I was God's man of paste and flour. Completely useless. I thought I was a complete package, that God was so lucky to have me and I looked down on those who weren't as zealous as I was, those that wandered away 
I looked down on them. Guess what happened? 16 years of wandering away, realizing that I'm nothing without him. Psalm 103 says, For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. Yet through those years, and I'm sorry, I'm dropping a bit of testimony in here. I didn't really plan to. I hope that's okay. But it's the word of our testimony. We overcome by the word of our testimony. It's the word of God working through our testimony. Through those years of wandering, God was present. He sent me so many messages. He gave me a good friend who, who in a bantery, the Archbishop of Banterbury, kept in touch with me and just dropped little droplets of truth. And I, I run marathons, and, and I can remember running the Manchester Marathon. And um, it was on a Sunday, and I was running away, Manchester Marathon, and there was a girl standing outside the church. I think it might have been the Church of the Nazarene. And she got a big sign, and it says, What are you running away from? And I just knew that God was just speaking to me. I went to a rehearsal of my son's wedding, and I was asked to read the, the, the scripture passage, and I read 1 Corinthians 13. The vicar came up to me after, and he said, uh, We need to have a chat. He says, You know something, don't you? And I went to see him. I was very brave. I went to see him. And he said, can I pray for you? And he's one of these charismatic types. Go on. Okay. And he prayed and he had a picture. And I didn't tell him that I was a runner, but he had a picture of me running. But there was a big elastic band attached to my back, pulling me back. So, Jeremiah went through this time of darkness, yet God was still there. What about you this morning? Are you feeling that all happiness is gone? What you hoped for from the Lord hasn't happened. But the reality is, hope. We're in Hope Church, and there is hope. In the midst of all the darkness, verse 21, Jeremiah, by the Holy Spirit, was enabled to cry out. Yet, in the midst of all this dark times, in the midst of all this forgotten happiness, in the midst of my teeth grinding on gravel, I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed. For his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. You, this morning, whether you realize it or not, you are being pursued by the compassions of God the loving kindness, the loving mercies of God. And that's why you're not consumed. He's after you. He's coming after you today. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. It's an unceasing love. It's steadfast. Everybody, we want a foundation. His love is steadfast and it's unceasing and it's coming after you. But I'm sitting in darkness. I don't know the Lord's presence. I've been. His steadfast love is coming after you. They knew every morning. Great is your faithfulness. You're never without hope. His streams of mercy are coming towards you. His love towards you and his compassion will chase you, literally chase you down the years 
and it will bring you to the place where you call to mind and have hope restored. See, the fictional Chuck Noland, a.k.a. Yeah, from Castaway. He did get some hope. He, he was rescued from this fictional island. But what about Pastor Zhang? What happened in his darkness? The constant intrusion. Well, he found hope in his darkness. And he was given a job in the prison camp of emptying the night soil pit. Now, that's where all the human waste goes, and it has to get dug out and emptied. And that was his job. Now, you think, that is the worst job ever, I can imagine. But the reality is, nobody, when he worked in the night soil pit, nobody else would go anywhere near him. So there was no surveillance, there were no guards, there were no other prisoners. There was just him and God in all this human waste. And he came to, to see this as a garden of hope. And he called it his rose garden. And there's an old Baptist hymn that goes, I'm not going to sing it to you. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses. And the voice I hear falling on my ears, the Son of God discloses. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am, I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. He speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet, the birds hush their singing. And the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. And that was the song he used to sing in his rose garden. And he did get released, but that was his place of hope. So what's the basis of our hope? As a Christian, as a believer this morning, what is the basis of our hope? The basis of our hope is steadfast because 2,000 years ago, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, stepped down from glory and he fully entered the night soil pit of this world. He came down to where we are. And he came to save us, to redeem us, to cleanse us, to wash us, to forgive us, to give us hope, we put our trust in him. John 3.16, everybody knows it. For God so loved the world. What an absolutely powerful scripture. For God so loved the world. How did he so love the world? He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whoever would put their trust in him, rest in him, not perish in the night soil pit but have everlasting life. The Bible tells us in Ephesians 2 that before we came to faith in Jesus, we were without hope, without God, and we were in the world. It's not a nice place to be, is it? Without hope, without God, and in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. So even in your darkest times, the hope of the good news of the gospel will shine out. Every morning, when I do my morning run, I thank God and I say, Lord Jesus, thank you that I'm baptized. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, I'm baptized into Christ. And I've got a new identity and I've got a new address. My life is hid with Christ in God. That's our address, our identity, our address. That's where you'll find me. 
or by the grace of God. For the Lord is good to those who hope in him, to the one who seeks him. It's good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Verse 31, for no one is cast off by the Lord forever. And though he brings grief, he will show compassion. So great is his unfailing love. You came near when I called you, and you said to me, do not fear. Lord, you took up my case. You redeemed my life. My prayer this morning is for all of us, for me and for you, it can be found in Romans. And Paul says, may the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace as we trust in him so that we may overflow with hope. And how do we f overflow with hope? By the power of the Holy Spirit. I just feel that it would be good if we, we just ask now the Holy Spirit to come and overflow, bring that overflow of hope into lives where hope is dim, hope is gone, hope is dark. We need the Holy Spirit. He's our comforter, he's our strengthener, he's the one that comes alongside. He shows us Jesus, he brings us to faith. So I'm going to pray that we would overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. We're just going to ask the Holy Spirit to come into our midst and glorify the Lord Jesus. Father God, we come before you this morning. I pray, Father, that you would fix your word into our hearts, all that has been said that is of you. Father, may it be a, uh, a nail in a sure place. May it convict and, and set us free, bring us hope and help. All that's not been of you, Lord, that's said that's just human invention, I pray that that will be wiped away. Father, we come to you. We thank you that your throne is the throne of, of grace and that we can have confidence. And when we come with confidence to your throne of grace, your word says that we receive mercy and we find grace to help in time of need. So your promises to us are great, Lord, and we, we now ask, Father, that you'd send your Holy Spirit into our midst, to minister deep into our hearts. Precious Holy Spirit, we welcome you this morning. Holy Spirit, we pray that you would glorify the Lord Jesus Christ, that you would overflow into our lives, that you'd fill us afresh, that you would bring people to faith, that you'd bring hope where there's darkness. Pray, Father, for that one that has been suffering from panic attacks. Father, we ask that in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ that you would bring an end to that. Lord, would you touch that person this morning? That their breathing and their, their, their whole being would, would be filled with your peace. the one that's struggling with chronic pain. Father, would you just bring healing to that person this morning by the power of the Holy Spirit that they'd have a new freedom in Jesus' name. And now, Lord, as we worship you, I pray that you would just again continue with us and be glorified in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.